science fiction does allow us to foresee the unforeseen, to prepare us for the future, for the unpredictable future. The writer Arthur C. Clarke is the nearest thing we have to a modern-day soothsayer. He is a one-man think tank, listened to by the United Nations, Microsoft and NASA. He was the first to propose communication satellites and, at the age of 27, prove their technical feasibility. And 30 years ago, his script for the film 2001 was so ahead of its time, it helped kick-start research into artificial intelligence. This is a film about a young boy from a post office family in Somerset who left that world behind to become one of the most respected visionaries of our time. Arthur C. Clarke may have made his name with 2001 A Space Odyssey, but with the next millennium looming on the horizon, the date 2001 can no longer be used as shorthand for the future. So Clarke has spun the calendar forward a thousand years with his new novel, 3001, The Final Odyssey. Despite its 31st century subject matter, he chose to write the book surrounded by the fading colonial splendor of the Gaul Face Hotel in Sri Lanka, the country he calls home. I lived here in this room, made one or two trips outside, went home I think a couple of times for a few hours, but essentially I was in this room you know, for three weeks, and during that time I wrote the core of the book. My agent told me that there was great pressure on me to do this, and I said, no way. Then they started to wave green paper in front of me until my eyes glazed over. But even then, I must say, that I would not have done it purely for the money. I suddenly realized I had an opening, a perfect opening, for the, the new, the final installment, and that was it. introduced to the strange new world of 3001 through the eyes of an astronaut revived after floating frozen in space for a thousand years. A thousand years does give you room to imagine almost anything, anything which we could imagine that could be done in that period of time. So I've taken the things that interested me, things which seemed dramatic and as well as being possible, and just developed them. Clark conceives of a world in which, amongst other things, animals are biologically engineered to create a new generation of domestic servants. People exchange information through palm-to-palm -palm contact as much as by talking. And improved global business and communication links have led to the abolition of all time zones. Few people would pay such predictions serious attention if it weren't for Clark's track record as a writer whose fiction has foreshadowed a string of real-life inventions, like video phones, email, the space shuttle, laptop computers, and cloning. This is a sign of person that the world needs a lot more of. 
We have incredible numbers of specialists, and yet how many people do we have that are synthesizing this knowledge and visioning the future? It is possible to see patterns that others haven't seen. And I think that that is uh, certainly something that Arthur Clarke has done. Science fiction plays a very important role, and that what it does is opens the minds of people, particularly young people, as we know, uh, to, the, to the potential existence of alternatives. Despite the sweep of his vision of the next millennium, Clarke maintains that future shock may be a thing of the past. I think anyone coming, say, from the Battle of Hastings to our time would be, we'd want to go crazy. I mean, everything would be totally strange. Whereas I suspect that if we were sent a thousand years in the future, much of the technology, I mean, would, it would be strange and marvelous, but it wouldn't be totally alien. It's hard to imagine there'd be anything that will totally overwhelm us, but there may be, even in a hundred years' time. Throughout his life, Clark has used his science fiction imagination as a lever on the real world, thinking the unthinkable. As when, some 50 years ago, he was responsible for revolutionizing modern communications. Towards the end of the war, I got this idea of using satellites as relay stations. British television started just before the war and was stopped, of course, when the war began. So I'd seen some television and uh, realized, of course, that the range of ground-based transmitters was very limited because of the curvature of the Earth. So obviously, if the higher you could get, the better. If you could get right out into space, you could cover half the Earth in one go. And there was this particular 24-hour orbit, and the satellite at that height, at that particular distance, would stay fixed over the same spot on the Earth. So I wrote this up in a short article, and that's where the whole thing started. And sometimes I feel like the late Dr. Frankenstein now, years later, communication satellites fly through space in what is known as the Clark Orbit, and the satellite barons like Rupert Murdoch and Ted Turner still consult with the man who made their business possible in the first place. Indeed, Clark's house once served as the CNN downlink for the whole of Sri Lanka. He is, in fact, living in the electronic cottage and, uh, and is a uh, symbol uh, of the potential, of the possibility of living anywhere and still being plugged into the world of change and advancing technology. Clark lives in Cinnamon Gardens, a leafy quarter of Colombo, Sri Lanka's capital, where he shares a house with his business partner and family. There he spent most of his writing career behind a small desk, thinking the big ideas which have made him the country's most famous resident. Wonderful guy. I like the people, and it's a beautiful country, and it really has everything. Yeah, okay, so that too, uh, Ruskalen. But it was the Indian Ocean which first attracted Clark to Sri Lanka. People are often surprised that I'm interested in diving and underwater exploration, which is what brought me to Ceylon, as it was then, back in 1956. And the reason is simple. I realized when the scuba, you know, scuba equipment was invented that I could experience something very close to weightlessness in the sea, uh, something which is, of course, one of the characteristics of space flight. And, of course, all the astronauts now use scuba as part of their training. You can really see how in this tropical paradise, away from all the sort of concerns and theorems and uh, prejudices of Western society, he comes up with these, these crazy ideas, then runs with them and ends up with something that's a, a diamond-like 
center of a, of a, of a a new invention or a new way of looking at the universe that no one's really ever thought of before. Clark has said that it was in Sri Lanka, 6,000 miles from where he was born, that he first felt he had come home. He left behind the England of the 50s and a childhood in rural Somerset. We're an old post office family. My mother was a post office telegraphist, and she could still read and send Morse at, a, at quite an old age. And uh, father was also in the post office engineer, and uh, my aunt ran the local post office. And so, you know, it was really in my blood, and that, that just had something to do with my later involvement in communications on a slightly more sophisticated level in the Morse key. I was born at Minehead, and then I moved inland to Taunton, to the family farm, where I spent most of my youth. Didn't help much on the farm, I'm afraid, because I was too busy reading science fiction magazines. One thing that really triggered off his writing was uh, when he was at school, he used to slip down to W.H. Smith's and get these little pulp magazines, which used to come over from the States. And he used to avidly read these stories, and then he used to find fault in them. And quite often there was a letter from him, you know, saying why it wouldn't have turned out that way. And then one day somebody wrote and said, well, if you think you can do better, do better. I never imagined I could make a living by writing. I regarded writing as, uh, you know, it was, it was fun. I was an amateur writer. Most of my publications were in amateur magazines, um, not even printed magazines, but churned out in the old mimeograph machines, you know, and get and covered with ink and <laughs> cutting stencils. Oh, talk about changes of technology. <laughs> In his long career as an author, Clark has published over 80 books, winning acclaim for novels like Childhood's End and Rendezvous with Rama, and becoming the best-selling science fiction writer in the world. Science fiction has so many opportunities that it is a danger, of course, that you may run wild in all directions. But uh, I can't understand any intelligent person not enjoying science fiction. In fact, if anyone doesn't enjoy science fiction, he says they don't like it, don't understand it, there is something wrong with them. Invalid Directory, that's funny. Oh, of course, yes. See, it's uh, hard to find a writer of the current generation, that is, writers who are now, say, in their 30s, who can look at uh, science with the same kind of delight and pleasure and awe that Clark does. Here in this London suburb, space scientists, industrial designers, and conceptual artists from all over the world are gathering at the MGM studios. For the film 2001, Clark collaborated with director Stanley Kubrick, writing the screenplay and novel in tandem, as well as acting as a scientific advisor. ...to contribute their knowledge, their ideas, their visions, to advise and consult in the filming of Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey. Well, visually, it's breathtaking. It was so stunning and looked like nothing else that had been made. I felt like I had been ripped out of the cradle, like I'd been transported into a, into a universe where m miraculous things were possible. Well, there was never a movie like it before, and there hasn't been a movie since. Uh, but it did influence the look of space in all movies and television shows since then. Uh, in a way, 2001 is timeless. It's sort of in, in a time warp of its own. Stanley said, I want to make the proverbial good science fiction movie, implying that there hadn't been any at that, up to that date. Given the literally cosmic dimensions of the film, Clark and Kubrick were determined to root it in some kind of scientific reality. Enormous efforts went into accurately visualizing the universe beyond the thin, protecting veil of the Earth's atmosphere. The details are what matter, even if you're not aware of them at the time. 
we worked together and brainstormed and uh, developed ideas and threw away you know, most of them and another thing eventually evolved over a period of almost four years. Nearby, another of the film stars, Gary Lockwood, goes through the long daily routine of being dressed in his astronaut spacesuit. Well, I'd say it's one of the highlights of my career. It's not the best role I've ever had, but it was certainly the best time I've ever had. 2001 was, was put together by a lot of very brilliant people. I mean, I, I've never seen anything like it, ever. Hello, Hal, do you read me? But Hal, the ship's computer with a mind of its own, was the real star of 2001. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. In creating Hal as a fictional entity, he made it, he, he, he took all of this specialized knowledge and, and gave us a very visceral notion of what it means if computers become as intelligent as humans. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. So to think forward far enough to imagine a computer that can do natural language and reasoning, even scheming, uh, a computer that is capable of dealing with ethical dilemmas, uh, that's very out there for 1968, and yet uh, many of the areas of artificial intelligence uh, are moving in exactly those directions. Hal's artificial intelligence was only one element of 2001's grand philosophical subject. On the human side, we are concerned with nothing less than man's place in the universe and his possible position in the pecking order of cosmic intelligence. The film's central theme was an exploration of the evolution of humanity. From bone power to brain power. From ape to human to artificial intelligence and beyond. But 2001 left its first audiences perplexed. It did contain all sorts of subtleties and a lot of people were baffled at the first viewing. In fact, uh, the, the initial reaction to the film was very strange. I mean, um, it was a, a disastrous in many ways. I remember the opening night, I, I had a seat in the balcony for that premiere. And after the intermission, uh, my date and I were able to find good seats on the first floor because so many people had walked out, including Rock Hudson, who stalked down the aisle saying, well, somebody tell me what the hell this is about. We premiered in Washington. We premiered New York City. We were raked by the critics. No one liked us. One MGM executive after the first screen said, well, well, that's the end of Stanley Kubrick. And within eight or ten days, the audiences were all over the streets. I have an electronic mutiny on my hands. Just as ready, you see, and the rear okay, but when I press the and the change to try, to try to get going, nothing happens. Ah! In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The film's success made Clark rich and earned his writing a new global audience. He continued to produce novels and screenplays, including two follow-ups to 2001. But last year, when he was hit by a recurrence of a debilitating polio-related illness, completing the quartet with 3001 hung in the balance. It's very really complicated. Uh, I mean, other people's illnesses I know are very boring, but what I've got now is this newly invented disease, post-polio syndrome. 
which um, very few people ever got before because no one lived long enough to get it. In fact, uh, I s even think that it's a definite advantage oh, no. to a writer not to be too mobile. And <laughs> I, I don't have all these issues of running around that I used to have. But luckily, it hasn't interfered too much with my table tennis, as some of your crews discovered. <laughs> small TV black and white camera onto my telescope instead of the normal eyepiece and I can sit here in my office and look at the image on the TV screen and with a couple of levers I can fly over the face of the moon as though I'm in a spaceship so when I'm too old and feeble to get to the telescope I can still sit here and enjoy the lunar landscapes <laughs> the Apennines, Sea of Rain, Samari Embrium. Move a little, no, coming up there, ah, there, there is Plato there on the bottom right, and that pyramid just below it is Pico, where the fin final scene of 3001 takes place. Riding high on the popularity of 2001, and with a growing reputation as a good communicator with a boldly scientific imagination, Clark was the obvious candidate to help cover the moon landings for American TV. Well, for thousands of years now, it's been man's dream to walk on the moon. Right now, after seeing it happen, knowing that it happened, it still seems like a dream. Arthur, uh, you've been dreaming of this moment long before many of us did. What was your feeling when we saw this thing happen today? Time just stopped for me, and I think it stopped for everybody. It was just a, a hole in history, you know, and every, the whole world's... everything. My heart stopped, breathing stopped. And welcome to Cyberfest. And welcome to people watching and listening all over the world on the World Wide Web, including Mr. Arthur C. Clarke in Sri Lanka, who will be joining us later by the miracle not only of the internet, but also of the communication satellites that he was the first to propose. Clark's unorthodox yet influential writing career was officially recognized in America earlier this year when scientists, celebrities and fans from around the world convened to pay tribute to this far-sighted thinker and his new work, 3001. Mr. Arthur C. Clark. Very nice, okay. Now, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to have a chance of talking to you from uh, Colombo. We have a question now from Gary Lockwood, one of the stars of the film. Ah. Hello, Arthur. Long time no see. Lo lovely to hear from you, and uh, you are glad to know, of course, I revived, I revived you in 3001. <laughs> In 3001, Clark revives the astronaut Frank Poole, who was attacked by the rogue computer HAL a thousand years earlier and was last seen drifting in space, air supply severed and presumed dead. In 2001, you see Frank Poole spinning off into space to the far reaches of the universe, and that, you think, is the end of Frank Poole. Uh, but I, I realize, you know, that not, it might not be if he's deep frozen in a thousand years' time and someone picks him up again and brings him back, he could be revived. I think this is quite possible. 
seems to me what is remarkable about um, 3001 is here we have an author who's approaching 80 years old and he's just as ingenious, creative, and forward-looking as he was 30 years earlier. Frank Poole gets a crash course in a thousand years of history using what is perhaps the most dramatic of Clark's predictions, the brain cap, a device which would enable us to tap directly into the workings of the mind and hardwire raw knowledge directly to the cerebral cortex. Well, the idea of the brain cap, I think, is quite reasonable. I imagine you'd have to have a helmet of some kind, closely fitting, and I suspect you'd have to put nanoprobes into the, through the skull, which would be quite painless, it'd be so fine. I think one day it may be possible to tap into our thoughts. After all, the brain is some kind of electrochemical computer. We're already experimenting with reading, you know, the neural currents in the brain, and in principle one could have inputs and outputs as to an ordinary computer. And then the possibilities of course are enormous. But perhaps the real surprise in 3001 is that Clark retains a near religious faith in scientific progress, even as the 20th century draws to a close and ever fewer people are convinced technology can deliver easy solutions to the problems of the next millennium. There is an optimism in, in his writing and it grows, I think, from his belief that finally problems will yield to scientific solution. My writing is almost always optimistic. There's a lot of, I think, cyberpunk out there. Unpleasant, violent futures are obviously much more dramatic. And I feel that if you are optimistic, you have a chance of creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah.